When Cayenne was 12 weeks old and Marco six years old, my husband Rustin and I gave him puppy training lessons for Christmas. With Cayenne and her crate in the car, I would pick Marco up from school on Tuesdays, drive to the Burger King for a planet-sustaining health food dinner of burgers, coke, and fries, and then head to the Santa Cruz SBCA for our lesson. Like many of her breed, Cayenne was a smart and willing youngster, a natural to obedience games. Like many of his generation raised on high-speed visual special effects and automated cyborg toys, Marco was a bright and motivated trainer, a natural to control games. Cayenne learned cues fast, and so she quickly popped her bum on the ground in response to a sit command. Besides, she practiced at home with me. Entranced, uh, Marco at first treated her like a microchip implanted truck for which he held the remote controls. He punched an imaginary button. His puppy magically fulfilled the intentions of his omnipotent remote will. God was threatening to become our co-pilot. <laughs> I, an obsessive adult who came of age in the communes of the late 1960s, was committed to ideals of intersubjectivity and mutuality in all things, certainly including dog and boy training. The illusion of mutual attention and communication would be better than nothing, but I really wanted more than that. Besides, here I was the only adult of either species present. Intersubjectivity does not mean equality, a literally deadly game in dogland, but it does mean paying attention to the conjoined dance of face-to-face -face significant otherness. In addition, control freak that I am, I got to call the shots at least on Tuesday nights. <laughs> Marco was at the same time taking karate lessons, and he was profoundly in love with his karate master. This fine man understood children's love of drama, ritual, and costume, as well as the mental, spiritual, bodily discipline of his martial art. Respect was the word and act that Marco ecstatically told me about from his lessons. He swooned at the chance to collect his small, robed self into the prescribed posture and bow formally to his master or his partner before performing a form. Calming his turbulent first grade self and meeting the eyes of his teacher or his partner in preparation for demanding stylized action thrilled him. Hey, was I going to let an opportunity like that go unused in my pursuit of companion species flourishing? Marco, I said, Cayenne is not a cyborg truck. She is your partner in a martial art called obedience. You are the older partner and the master here. You have learned how to perform respect with your body and your eyes. Your job is to teach the form to Cayenne. Until you can find a way to teach her how to collect her galloping puppy self calmly and hold still and look you in the eyes, you cannot let her perform the sit command. It would not be enough for her just to sit on cue and for him to click and treat. That would be necessary, certainly, techniques is, is fine, but the order was wrong. First, these two youngsters had to learn to notice each other. They had to be in the same game. It is my belief that Marco began to emerge as a dog trainer over the next six weeks. It is also my belief that as he learned to show her the corporeal posture of cross-species respect, she and he became significant others to each other. Two years later, out of the kitchen window, I glimpsed Marco in the backyard doing 12 weave poles with Cayenne at speed when nobody else was present. The weave poles are one of the most difficult agility objects to teach and to perform. I think Marco and Cayenne's fast, beautiful weave poles were worthy of his karate master. Next slide. <laughs> Training a dog has been, I think, the most humbling uh, discipline that I have ever engaged in. I think I have been forced to a quality, a, a kind of a consistent honesty, which teaching human beings does not prepare one for. Indeed, I think successful teaching of human beings depends upon the strategic use of lies. But I assure you <laughs> that in working with a dog, that would get one precisely nowhere. So as a late middle-aged lady, I take up an ambition to get uh, into the nationals in a fairly demanding team sport called agility which is played on something oh, roughly 120 feet on a side, picture 15 to 20 obstacles, a six foot high plywood A-frame, a teeter-totter, a series of jumps, a, bun a bunch of tunnels, 12 weave poles in a row separated by 24 inches where the dog weaves through at speed, set in a pattern by the judge, neither the dog nor the human being has seen the, the prescribed course ahead of time. One learns to recognize obstacles in certain patterns, there are various pattern sets, that you learn to recognize and perform in various ways. 
Uh, the game is scored. Partners are scored by accuracy and time. People win or uh, people place or, uh, or not in this sport is a function of hundreds or tens of seconds. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of choreographed um, pattern at speed uh, mutual, you know, between uh, members of different species. Okay? Uh, people who are serious about the game train uh, with a teacher and other, other students at least once a week and usually train several times a week for 15 or so minutes a day on their own. Uh, people partic participate in the sport, usually one, oftentimes many more weekends a month. Uh, there are, um, in any given weekend in the, in the United States, a, a few, um, oh, I don't know, maybe a hundred trials going on around the United States in any given weekend. In each trial there may be approximately 250 to 300 dogs and their associated humans performing. Uh, it's, a it's a sport that's roughly 15 years old in the United States. It originated in Great Britain at the Krupp's Dog Show as a kind of entertainment between the main action of the confirmation show and the obedience show. Uh, became uh, popular worldwide. The last national competition was won by the Brazilians. Uh, the former Soviet bloc countries have come up very fast in the sport. Uh, the um, Latin American countries uh, feel highly competitive teams in agility. The United States rarely places close to the top, but occasionally it does. Um, it's a sport that runs entirely as a volunteer, as, as an amateur and volunteer sport at this point. Whether it will professionalize in the near future or not remains to be seen. But it means that ordinary Kletzi competitors run with, with world-class competitors in the same events, um, which is both humbling and, and inspiring. And above all, it means that um, people such as me who lived with dogs for many years but never actually tried to do anything with a dog. Uh, beyond sort of get through the day in a kind of decent way. The, the actual effort to learn to communicate across species difference um, in a, a coherent way um, in which both members participate in doing something that neither one can do alone has been transformative of, of my notion actually of ethical discourse. Because I've come to think a great deal about the question of timing and the question of coordinated communication and the question of what it takes to do something that is natural to neither partner but an achievement of both. Uh, the uh, engaging in this sport uh, and, uh, and the, uh, the effort to be mindful in engaging in this operation of training has taught me something about the discipline of the sport of obedience. Uh, questions of authority, questions of honesty, questions of coherence that I don't learn in my human teaching. Uh, I'd be happy to talk more about this issue later but because of constraints of time, I actually want to say more about the temporality of history and the question of thinking about dogs um, and dog-human relationships historically and kind of relentlessly turtles all the way down or elephants all the way down, depending upon which um, particular kind of, of, of stories you want to tell. I, I want to talk a little bit about the relentlessly historical nature of this, of this kind of relationality because people tend to think so typologically about almost everything, most certainly including dogs. I feel like I need to do this. Now I'm deliberately going to tell these breed stories or kind stories by referring to three sorts of dogs, all of which raise particularly irresolvable contradictions and bring with them burdens of world history. First I will talk about two sorts of dogs that are involved in pastoral economies, that are involved in raising meat and, meat and fiber animals and have been involved in uh, raising meat and fiber animals for some time. We'll talk first about Great Pyrenees, these large white... Whoops, wait, hang on, we need to look at the agility pictures, I forgot to show you these. Yay. That's Cayenne at work, uh, at her job, <laughs> leaping through one of the obstacles on the agility field. Uh, we, uh, that's Cayenne going over a hurdle. I think you can uh, safely say that she's seriously engaged in the game and probably isn't being coerced. Uh, the next slide, we have another really wonderful dog uh, named Roland, Roland Dog, uh, who um, is uh, actually an instance of fraud of the, um, of the sort that I'm particularly proud of. He has an AKC registration as an Australian Shepherd, although we're almost certain that his father was a child. Uh, he is a, <laughs> the reason I got the AKC registration was so that I could play with them, play in their sandbox. Uh, and you have to have the registration, all you have to do is castrate the guy and then you can get the fraudulent registration. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Reproductive politics in dogland are highly edifying. 